We'll go on to that forum now, and Kath touched upon it there. This is your chance to ask the board, um, and I might remind you that um, the board are appointed by the minister to give us, as HEC, the strategic direction to deliver the plans for the red meat industry in Wales. So this is your chance to, to ask those bigger picture macro strategic questions to the board. Um, so the questions can be from the floor here and also virtually. So, so if you indicate in the usual way, please, with your hands that you wish to ask a question and then we'll get the roving mic of which there are two with Laura and Heather. Um, so just wait until the mic arrives and we'll, uh, we'll ask the questions and I'll ask the board to come up to the mic here and address you with, with the answers. So let's have the first question. I think I've got uh, Wynne Evans, um, NFU Livestock Board Chair. Wynne, please. Um, thank you. And, and thank you, Chair, for that uh, inspirational and informative um, address, really. It was a lot of facts were provided there and, uh, and it's very useful. But, you know, how, you know, you know, informing people and changing people's perceptions is so important. But what frustrates me, especially in the last week now, we've been, I feel like as, as a sector that we've been chucked under the bus by a government minister up in Glasgow. And I think his comments were totally, he wasn't educated enough and he took his uh, information off in context. And uh, I think, you know, I think it's about time that we educated these people on even further on how we produce red meat here in Wales and to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, to address them and get them to think the Welsh way properly. Because, you know, they're taking calculations, global calculations, which are incorrect as far as we're concerned. So I think Lee Walters does need educating and addressing. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Wynne. So the question is around um, sustainability and messaging. Uh, rightly, we're probably not going to comment directly on the Deputy Minister's comments, but I think you mentioned the Welsh way, and just to paint before I ask Rachel to, to answer the question, but, but I think the Welsh way has been a definitive um, document that we produced back a year ago now, with another iteration, which we produced a couple of weeks ago on what actually could happen on farm, to, to show uh, that we are undertaking some work on, on carbon and reducing carbon emissions. Um, but I think your point is well made. Rachel, can, can, can we perhaps um, outline what we have to offer as a sustainable industry in Wales and how we might help on the journey towards 2050 and net zero, which is an important target that we've all got to be part of? You might not get me down, that's the trouble. Once I get started on this subject, you might have to kick me off. But um, you're right. And I think the frustrating thing about COP is actually agriculture just isn't on the agenda. And I think we're indirectly affected. And I think it's quite overwhelming, I think, as a farmer the last week, actually how much we're impacted, but actually we haven't really got a voice at that table. So you're right. But the way I see it and the way that I think we need to position ourselves is it's, it's not about defence, it's about promotion. And I think perfecting the Welsh way, what that does, it takes what we had last year with the Welsh way and it builds upon it at farm level to actually start to get our foundations ready, to start those building blocks, because it's a jigsaw and it's about getting all those elements ready. And actually, we've, as, you know, as we've heard already, we've got a great story to tell in Wales. We really have. And I'm so confident that we can be part of the solution. Um, you know, hands up, we're, we're, we're part of the problem, but we can be part of the solution. And that's where we're uniquely placed. So... For me, it, it's all about promotion. It's about getting our own businesses in order as well. And that's where, if you look at the perfect in the Welsh way, it gives you those elements. And as we've already heard, you know, carbon efficiency goes hand in hand with general business efficiency and profitability that, you know, win-win situation. So I think there's plenty of exciting things out there, lots of opportunities, but we, we, we've got to be willing to get them as well. We've got to be wanting to be part of the solution. We've got to get our data in order and we've got to be willing to really sort of look at our businesses in the right way. Does that answer your question? Or One of my things is that 
Yeah, great. I mean, as Gwen said, I won't comment on the minister's comments first off, but I see that it's almost, it, it, it's not just the government. We also need to be looking at su supply chain, engaging with them, our consumers. It's almost this full plethora of all those people because, um, you know, those comments are reflected elsewhere. We know that elsewhere in the media as well as um, personal opinion. So I think it, it's really key that we start to demonstrate, but I'll go back to the point about data. We can't keep saying things unless we can back it up with data. And I think that's really key at farm level that we make sure that, um, and you know, I don't want to drop the bombshell in terms of carbon calculating, because I know we'll have loads of conversations about that. Um, but actually we need to start doing this stuff because we can't keep saying stuff. We've got to back it up as well. And I think that's how we can really start to change the agenda. Um, I know Kath mentioned sort of, or alluded to GWP star, and, and that's another possible element in our toolkit in terms of how we start to direct and change this agenda and actually help people with their understanding. Because I think that there's probably been a slight phase where there's been a bit of a void and certain voices perhaps have filled that void sometimes. And I think it's really important that, that you know, we're all part of this solution, that we don't just point to perhaps at individual comments. Okay, lovely. Thank you, Rachel. I think it's worth just me chipping in, uh, Wynn, because I think we're starting from a strong base and let us not, not forget that the data and evidence in the Welsh way is very, very clear. It shows that we are best in class on this planet in terms of sustainable lamb and beef production in Wales. That's a hell of a good start, really. Yes, we can do better. And I think we need to show that we are striving to do better through the schemes that we have, for example, in, in, in red meat, um, which we'll hear later on uh, from the farmers involved, involved in that. So yes, we can still do better, but we, we also need to probably approach the problem. Yes, we're part of the problem. And how can we be innovative on the front foot? And, and other industries will be saying, yes, we need to have this journey for 2020, 2050. And this is what we are gonna be doing. And I think there's an opportunity for us to, to do that, to have more research, to have innovation, um, to be ahead of the game and to demonstrate them in a proactive way as opposed to perhaps having conflict. So I think we mustn't be, we must own the space and we mustn't be shy because we have a very, very good story, not only on production, but on sequestration as well. So we have the answers as well. So I think we must approach it. We're, yes, I agree with you in terms of communication, but I think it's a duty for us all to communicate all of those special and positive message in a coherent way and, and that people understand and acknowledge it. So I think it's a very good question. It's for us all collegiately to, uh, to embark on over the next years really, because um, um, I think it, we could have some positives out of this, definitely. Jack, are you, are you willing to, yeah. to have a word on that? I'm just gonna- you, Jack Evershed. I win. Um, <clears throat> I think the reality of the situation that the people who have the ear of the press across the world are the people who are going to be saying we need to eat less meat to save the planet. So I think rather than be totally defensive and say no that that's not true, we have to say no, we have to persuade consumers to make the choice about what meat they do eat. So the, there are some meat production systems across the world that are very damaging but those are not the ones we have here. So rather than, the reality is that people like George Monbiot and people like that are gonna have the ear of the press. The politicians across the world are looking at a five year time horizon. They have the ear of the press. It's much easier for them to say, don't eat meat than to say, don't fly to Spain. But what we have to come at is saying, no, that's not true. We have to come at it and say, Yes, some of the meat production in the world is not good for the planet, but actually if you choose our product, you're making a proper choice so you can eat meat with a clear conscience. And it, not only is it sustainable, it's, it's some of the best meat in the world as well. So I think the way we come at it is very important rather than just the tendency is, and I know we've all been there, it's just to get angry when you hear it, but we've got to try to be more positive and constructive in our response, I think. 
Thank you, Jack. Rob Jenkins, Kiel Heil, Trevor Gluis, Rob. Um, the first question is, perhaps I should have known this before, I should have done some research before coming here. Does, you know, the methane that comes out of cows and sheep, does grassland sequate methane? We heard about grassland sequating and trees sequate carbon, but we, we never hear nothing about methane. And then in the story, you know, saying about red meat production, you know, I watched a program on Saturday morning, uh, beef came at the t top of the, the menu for carbon footprint. But when they said that, that it came at the top, did they take into account th the management of the grassland in Wales that is sequating carbon 365 days of the year if there's no snow on the ground? You know, trees only do it for five months. So have they brought those calculations in that, that grassland is actually neutralizing the effect of the cattle and the sheep that are grazing that grassland, which, which is, we're one of the few areas in the world now that can grow grass as efficiently as we can. You know, look at Australia, there's drought stricken areas there. You know, so we want to be producing as much red meat as possible for the whole world, really, because we can do it sustainably. And uh, I'm just wondering, does grassland sequate meat methane as well? Does okay. I'm going to ask Rachel as our expert to answer that because I think you touched on two important points, sequestration and methane, but also offshoring our carbon emissions elsewhere if we're not going to produce it here. So Rachel, can I ask you to answer that, please? Yeah, so we cover methane first. So first of all, agriculture in the UK is responsible for 10% of our total emissions of the UK. So unfortunately, it's not breaking down across the devolved nations. But then of our total UK emissions, basically agriculture produces 49% of the methane. So you can therefore see what the focus is. And then what, what we do when we talk about carbon emissions is actually we call them carbon, we sort of carbon equivalents. So we, we equate sort of nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide and methane all together to create a carbon dioxide equivalent. And that's how we calculate. So, um, and that's how we then sort of record sequestration is it for this carbon equivalent, so rather than individual gases. Um, so you're, you're right to mention it, but basically all those gases are bundled in together and they're, they're all sort of given different values, as we know with the whole argument with GWP star. Now, for your second point, now this is probably a little bit where it's, there's a bit of, bit of sort of wary understanding, I think, of farmers sometimes. We assume that all our grassland, whether we've got mountain land or pasture land, then actually it's constantly sequestering false it's a carbon store. We need to change the sort of the, the sort of the, um, the direction, the understanding here. So what we do is actually we manage carbon stores. So we're not sequestering new carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we need to we need that's why we need to plant trees. We need to improve soils that aren't at their optimum. But what we do need to understand is that actually managing a carbon store is just as important. So if you think if you've got ancient oak woodland, for example, now that doesn't belong on your BPS anymore, arguably. It doesn't sort of, perhaps in terms of productivity, um, it's not very valuable. Um, I'm forgetting the biodiversity sort of aspect. But actually, if you then went and cut down that woodland, if you think then about the carbon release of cutting down and burning um, oak woodland, you release that into the atmosphere. So actually what we need to start thinking is any existing woodland, any existing carbon in soils as a store and how we manage that store and keep the carbon there just as important as creating new sequestration. So that's where I think the dialogue starting to go, the understanding starting to go. Um, but, but that's sort of how it works. Does that answer the question? I can't, sorry. So well-managed grassland, you know, the way that uh, a lot of Welsh farmers are doing it now, you know, mob grazing, and it, it doesn't sequate carbon. It, it depends. So there's two schools of thought here. Basically, the science isn't quite right. So if you go to so um, certain schools of thought, think that actually we're at pretty much plateau in terms of our sequestration ability to sequester more in our soils and our grassland. Some schools of thought think that we've still got an opportunity. In truth, I think it probably depends on the state of your soils and how you manage them and actually what grass layers you've got in there. So, and actually, and how you manage those soils. So are you, are you routinely plowing them? Um, also in terms of nitrogen usage, in terms of which lays, you know, if you've got 
perhaps a multi-species layer, you, you get a lot of good cover, actually you, you're trapping a lot more and keeping a lot more carbon in those soils. So the truth is, the science isn't quite there yet, but it, it does vary. But we need to understand that we can't over-egg that potential in what we're already doing. It's about extra activity. And I think that's the key thing, is that we need to understand that in terms of a climate crisis, we need to be sucking down and sequestering much more carbon than we're already doing. But the thing is then, is we do, you know, as land managers, is we're in a really good position for producing food and also doing that. But it just needs a change of, a change of discussion, a change of direction, and probably a change of attitude sometimes, an attitude to go for these things. But there was another point, wasn't there, in terms of how we export the problem, and that's the risk. And I think that's where it's really important that ruminants play a key sort of feature and role. So you, you talked about grazing, you talked about mob grazing, um, and actually there are some interesting studies, um, mainly coming out of the States in terms of mob, mob grazing on a more regenerative system, actually, and they, they do increase the sequestration in soil, but actually it's really key that you have ruminants. You, you can't not have ruminants in, in that system. And likewise, you think about the east of the country, uh, in the UK overall, we've got a massive soil degradation because of lack of room in agriculture. So you can see there's a big role to play here. And the risk is, is that if we don't balance it up, is we start to export the issue for, you know, lesser systems, feedlot systems, where actually we export the carbon issue rather than manage it here. Sorry, you're still asleep while I sort of talk about this all day. Yeah, no, thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm going to move on, because I've got another question here, um, which is around abattoirs, which I'll ask probably priest to comment on really, and it's about abattoir capacity and I think for for pigs, which um, um, we're probably struggling for for the niche sector in Wales. But I think the, the combined question of, you know, are the problems post Brexit causing problems for export as well, i.e. Um, border inspection posts, which um, have come in since January 1st, uh, and the increased paperwork. So, so maybe a processor, um, a pr uh, view of, of life post-Brexit, please, please. Priest Morgan from uh, Keepak, who's been on the board for a while. Geoffrey's. Uh, from there. Um, from, um, I think, in, so if you look at the um, processing sector in Wales at the moment, it's true uh, across the UK that uh, staff availability is a challenge. And I think uh, a percentage of 20% um, less staff than what would uh, usually be required um, is, is commonly quoted across uh, the UK. And that has probably, and well, it has then reduced the capacity uh, in the plants. In terms of um, um, skilled work, um, in terms of um, operatives, it's across the board, really, and there is a significant competition out there at the moment uh, for people, be that for HCV drivers, for butchers, and there is a, a lack of um, skilled people in particular uh, at this point in time. I think that everybody um, across the industry has made a, efforts to uh, increase the flexibility, provide training as well, but that does take time uh, and that will um, show uh, its benefits, but it'll take a, a year or two probably to, for that to work its way through. Um, <clears throat> the other question was on capacity. Um, in terms of capacity in the UK, if you look at it um, across the UK, uh, I think um, on the red meat sector, um, there are plants, obviously lamb is uh, seasonal um, at certain times of the year, it's more or less at capacity. Uh, but that's uh, with the existing shift patterns. I think there would be more opportunity to kill more if the shift patterns were changed. On beef, um, there is, um, I would say, overcapacity uh, nearly throughout the year because it's uh, possible that all the plants can, and we've seen that over COVID as well. If there was an issue on one plant, then the other plants have increased their throughput. Um, when it comes to uh, pork, uh, that's more aligned and there is less um, spare capacity there. Um, it's much more of an integrated system, so that is uh, more of a challenge, and that's probably why we've seen the problems as well. Does that sort of answer the, most of the question? Yes, thank you, please. Don't go away. I have another question which has come in. Um, whilst I've got you, I'm getting my money's worth. Um, has COVID, how has COVID, rather, influenced consumer buying pattern um, in the UK market? 
Uh, dare I say it, COVID's been very positive in terms of uh, the consumer. Um, initially, um, if we think back, it was basically everybody bought mints um, because they didn't know really what else to buy. It was a safe bet, buy mints. But I think over the period of COVID, uh, people have had more time. They've been off on furlough and there's been plenty of cooking uh, um, programs on TV. And I think people have become more confident as well. I think it, there's a lot of a dynamic, really, if you, if you think about it. There's, they're getting messages that they should eat less. But I think really what we've come out of now is that um, because there weren't hotels and restaurants open, people have realized that they can cook at home. Uh, and that's really been beneficial. And they've taught themselves how to cook different joints, not just have mi uh, mince and chuck a bottle of something on it. Um, so the dynamic now is, and I think going forward, and that puts Welsh lamb and Welsh beef in a good position in that people may well eat uh, or buy less, but they're prepared to pay more for it. And I think that's something that's sort of showing itself. So in terms of COVID, um, it has definitely changed the way people have been shopping. Uh, they're more educated, I would say, now in terms of cooking and cooking at home and more confidence as well. So that can only be a, a good thing, really. There has been a dip off um, in terms of uh, retail sales, um, but it hasn't gone back to uh, pre-COVID levels. Um, that's because the restaurants and the hotels have, have opened up. Um, I think as well, um, if I can stray slightly off the question, is that it's really important that when people do go out and buy um, in restaurants and hotels that they know what they're buying as well because when they go to the retail shelf there's a lot of legislation in place and the labeling laws when you, if you go out to the restaurants and stuff and that's something that i think is as an industry and as hcc we will be looking at making sure and uh, influencing as much as we can to get that clear on the labels and on the menus because that's really important going forward because that's what you will see that the imported products will be going through to the food sector, food service sector, uh, whereas on the retail, it's uh, well, nearly over-regulated, I would say, in terms of labelling. Dear Chris, um, I've got a, a comment on uh, to, to just share with you on uh, online to the audience in Bilth. So um, it's about, yes, farmers can fix sequestration and have an important role to play, so subscribe to Alwyn's. Alwyn's comments there. And then I've got another question um, from William Powell, Councillor William Powell. I hope you're keeping well, William. And it's about public procurement into the, um, into the unitary authorities. And William is asking, looking ahead with optimism to 2022, what plans are there opportunities to make a persuasive case for greater public procurement um, of Welsh meat into local government and unitary authorities? Um, is there an opportunity there for HCC and the industry? So maybe, Kath, is, is, there, is there an opportunity is the question, and I suspect there is. Uh, thank you, William. Thanks for your, for your question online. And the overwhelming answer is yes. And I think one of the, one of the real opportunities that we have in, 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 in this challenge going forward is to say to governments that are discussing you know, what we should be eating and the comments that have come out more recently about consuming local meats and consuming sustainable meats. Well, we know, and we've already evidenced through the Welsh way and perfecting the Welsh way, that we've got some of the most sustainable systems on earth. And I think it's quite right that the public purse is money in relation to the foods that are in our schools and our hospitals and our care homes uh, provide that opportunity for those patients, those pupils and those residents to eat the very best sustainable meat products that they possibly can. And I think that's the challenge that we must take some leadership in in HCC and other levy bodies up and down the United Kingdom to ensure that we are engaging with governments. And, and I can say quite clearly that that is something we've been pursuing within our UK market strategy and Rhys may touch on it later. We are already working with local authorities and we are engaging with their procurement contracts to find out when they're renewed and to make the case for there to be PGI Welsh beef and Welsh lamb and pork from Wales on that procurement contract to ensure that where possible we do get local meats, Welsh meats 
on the menus of our schools, our hospitals, uh, our government buildings even. I think it's a really, really important point to make. Food service is commercial and that's a different challenge, but it's one we must nevertheless take head on as Priest mentioned earlier, but really and truly, this is where we can engage with governments, with local authorities, with health, with health education authorities to ensure that our school menus, our hospital menus, have local quality, ethical, sustainable meats, PGI, Welsh beef, lamb and pork from Wales on their menus. Thank you. Thank you, Kath. Um, I'm going to go to Richard Tudor, Van Swift. Richard, hang on, wait, wait for the mic to come. Uh, what's, uh, what's annoyed me lately in the, in, the, in the news, and it's come by, well, I haven't heard it officially, but it is right. How come the Cardiff Airport has bought a farm in Ceredigion to offload its carbon footprint? Where is the government? Well, Cardiff Airport is owned by the government. Isn't that, uh, isn't that not showing the right example? How can they do that? Surely they should clean up their own act rather than keep on going as they are. And this, you know, we're selling Wales again. And is it right that some, uh, the land that was sold in South Wales earlier on was for Heathrow Airport bought it? So therefore, you know, where are we with that? Should we be kicking up a fuss? Okay, it's uh, probably a comment more than a question for us, um, uh, Richard. But I think, is there anybody who wants to comment on on uh, buying probably land for trees. But I think the issue that you're really touchy, touching upon, Richard, is about carbon trading, isn't it? And offsetting. Um, I think that's the, the issue at the nub of your question. So so maybe uh, Priest has got his uh, indicator that he'd like to answer that one. So so offsetting, Priest, and ca carbon trading. Yeah. I think uh, um, it's uh, important when we, we look at carbon trading and, and offsetting and stuff, that's one thing. But I think we've got to look at it from uh, a red meat and look at it from the medium term as well. Because if we don't have the critical mass of supply, we won't have the supply chains in Wales. We won't have the processes. We won't have everything working as it should. And to be honest with you, with in, if you look at it, UK, we're not self-sufficient by a long way. Um, so there are other issues that we need to look at as well. And in terms of, um, uh, perhaps I'll be a bit controversial here, but if you want to plant trees, that's fine but we also need to look at the biodiversity that they're replacing. Because if you look at the sustainability, um, you need to look at um, biodiversity, water quality, and other things as well, rather than just look at reduced carbon full stop. It needs to be a balanced approach. And I think coming back on, on carbon, and um, Rachel and, and I have been discussing this, but you need, we need to look at it in the whole, rather than look what, what's the footprint of that piece of meat. Well, that piece of meat, hang on, has been grazing, it's been producing grassland, it gives you biodiversity, and perhaps it's been grazing in the, a windmill or whatever else. So that, that all has to come into effect because that landowner wouldn't be there unless it was for the lamb or the beef that is producing as well. So I think we need to really address, as Kath was saying earlier, you know, how do we really look at the carbon footprint or something and how that um, really um, affects uh, the rural economy and uh, the rural society as well. Thank you, Priest. Um, I'm going to squeeze one more question in because we're, we're two minutes over already and I want to try and keep to time. And it's, it's one which is pertinent. What is HEC doing to try and get the message about Welsh farming across in schools? And I'm going to ask Claire to, to deal with that one. Claire, do you Yeah. Um, well, it's going to be a test now to see who actually joined us last night on live online for our uh, uh, looking at the future, um, the, talking about the resources for um, red meat. So I had the fortune of uh, chairing that session. Um, I, like you, have sat here and thought, what are HCC doing in our schools? And I'm very pleased to tell you, actually, it's a great deal. There's a great deal of information and resources out there. And um, what we talked about last night was the launch of our hub online. So that hub is Red Meat Hub, Hub Key Cork Cymru. And I would encourage every member in this room to go away today and take a look at that resource because it's a resource full of information which is aimed at teachers, young people and health professionals. And particularly focusing on 
foundation right up to key stage four, which is from three to 16 year olds. And it tells our story. And the best thing about this narrative is it is uniquely Welsh. I've seen other resources available. And this one is particularly apparent for what is happening here on our farms in Wales and how we tell that story to our children, but that we do it in a very um, balanced way and provide them with the facts that they are searching for as individuals. And certainly the information that's there takes it right from farm all the way through to um, recipe ideas, safe preparation of food, um, even goes as far as food styling. But what I, being a farmer, I particularly liked about it is it, it told our story as well. It didn't, it doesn't um, insult the audience and that it's not patronizing. It, it tells it, you know, these are the farming practices we have on our farm and this is how your meat is, is grown and delivered to the plate and, and how you can utilize that in a way that's healthy and balanced. So um, I'd encourage you all to go away and look at that. And in last night's session, we were very fortunate to be joined by Elwyn Roberts, who's our consumer executive, and also um, Lloyd Henry, who's a food and nutrition teacher in Ysgol Govind Gwr. And um, Lloyd was instrumental in helping HCC in helping us prepare this document, which is a comprehensive guide to red meat. Now, this particular document is aimed primarily at um, those young people who are looking to study um, food related courses at GCSE level and other food courses. But it also goes a step further in that it provides the other element in looking at um, the health advisors as well, the health professionals. So it provides an array of fact sheets for those people. But what I really liked about this document is it covers all aspects. Again, it's not patronizing and you know, it really is an excellent resource. And the feedback we had from the session last night is the teachers can't get enough of it. They cannot get enough of it. And it made me stand back as a parent really. And I felt quite guilty in that I'm responsible that these resources are there, but we need to be shouting about it. And we need to be going into our schools and saying, have you seen this? Because every comprehensive in Wales up and down the country has had 25 copies of this particular document. So I'd love it if everyone in this room and everyone online went away and said, have you had this document? Are you utilizing it? I really do feel we have a responsibility as levy payers to do that. So the information is there. Let's all please use it and encourage our teachers and our health professionals to do so. Thank you, Claire. You've all got your homework to go home uh, with. Kath, very, very quickly, please, because I'm, I'm conscious that we are overrunning this session. So, Yeah, this is a very, very quick comment. I just could bounce about how important the next generation is. And Donaldson's new curriculum is coming in for Wales, and that is aimed at building ethical and informed citizens of the future and understanding where food comes from and how we produce red meat in Wales and the societal benefits of farming, the ethical and sustainable way in which we produce our red meat is so important. And these resources are Donaldson curriculum ready. They're absolutely fantastic. And, and as Claire says, you know, jump on board. They're on hub, they're accessible to all teachers, but it's a really, really critical role where HCC can and is demonstrating some leadership. So a very quick soundbite. I just wanted to jump in and say that. Thank you. Thank you, Kath. I'm going to draw this particular session to a close. Can I thank you for your participation as an audience here, um, both here in Bilth and indeed online? And I can, can I thank you, the board, for helping answering questions. I'm sure it's been a very uh, worth, well worthwhile session.